Uh, my more respectable side of who I am, I uh, write, uh, used to co-author the um, big book of benefits and mental health, which is produced by Mind. Uh, it's available from the exclusively from the Mind bookshop, so um, uh, they're, they're always willing to take your money. Um, and I sort of do a bit of... Uh, I write, um, write the books, I do a c column uh, in Mental Health Today, uh, and I do various training courses. I was doing one yesterday in Swansea, dotted around. Sometimes I go into to all sorts of places. Um, and that's, that's what I do for half of my week. And the other half of my week, um, which may be relevant to anyone here who's affected by cancer, I work with Maggie's Cancer Care. And uh, I work as the benefits advisor on their online centre. Uh, those of you who've ever been to Singleton, there's a, a Maggie's Centre, a, a proper one in a wonderful architect design building to give you a space to, uh, uh, to hang out uh, away from the hospital but close to the hospital where you can see cancer nurse specialists, benefits advisors, a psychologist there. Uh, there's a whole load of groups and everything. It's just in the grounds of a Singleton Hospital. The idea is to have one of those centres in every regional a cancer centre, um, Singleton's the first one in, in uh, Wales, uh, and I'm on the online centre which is available when you're not feeling like going to the hospital and you're at home and if you enter the worldwide wonder web <laughs> then um, you can look up Maggie's, uh, Maggie's Cancer Org and uh, you'll find a link there straight to the online centre. So you can send me your benefit queries and what's all this mean and what did you say in Llandovery? So why are, they change, why are they wanting to do welfare reform? Well, some of it is based on the idea that they want to simplify the system, they want to get more work incentives, they want to make the system more proactive and dynamic and all of those things. They'd also like £27 billion out of the system, please, thank you very much, uh, because we have a, a big deficit to fill. And uh, sometimes the politicians have got a bit sort of wild. Um, <laughs> Academics have charted how wild the politicians have got, um, and sometimes in their in their speeches, it's almost as though because the benefits budget is the biggest single budget, it's almost as though it's down to benefit claimants as to why we've got a budget deficit and the profligate Labour government was throwing loads of money out. Uh, no, I thought it was we were rescuing banks, but enough of the politics. This is uh, the only graph, and this is, it's sometimes said that the benefits um, system is spending is out of control. Most of the spending on those lines are sort of toddling along fairly normally. Um, benefits spending has been between 9 and 11% of, uh, of our national cake uh, for years and years. It goes up a little bit when unemployment goes up, and then, then it goes down again. The one that is zipping out of control is that top one and that's to do with housing benefit and that isn't because people are getting loads of money in their back pockets and living the life of Riley it's because we've as a society we've decided not to have rent controls and private rents have shot up and instead of subsidizing housing associations to build or councils to build we're preferring to put money into the market and that's, uh, that's how it goes. Uh, I think housing policy is beginning to come back into fashion across all political parties, so things might improve there. For the moment, what they're tending to do is blame the victim and cut, uh, cut like mad on the housing benefit, which means that people in private tenancies are finding themselves short of the rent. There are about 50 benefits, it depends how you count them. So how on earth do you find your way through? How do I get, make sure that the person I'm advising, the person I'm supporting, myself, how do I know I'm getting the most out of the benefit system? Well, through all the sort of training and, um, and books and whatever, I suggest this sort of three steps approach. It's based on the sound of music. For anyone who enjoys that film or was forced to watch it over Christmas, that do re mi scene where you're going up and down the steps. The first step is your basic benefits for uh, the ones that used to say what they did on the tin. So if you were feeling not very well, you claimed a benefit called sickness benefit. Successive governments like to simplify the benefit system, so sickness benefit has now become contributory employment and support allowance in the main phase with work-related activity component, because that's much easier to say than sickness benefit. 
So that's, that's your sort of basic earnings. A retirement pension will be one of those. It's your basic income, you paid your national insurance. It's the old 1948 beverage sort of type benefits with the names changed along the way. Um, then the question after that is, well, should I get a means-tested benefit? And those are, could I get those on top? That wasn't supposed to happen back in 1948. We were supposed to get rid of means-testing, but it's crept back in because governments of all parties have worked out it's a bit cheaper. Um, so as a result, um, retirement pension isn't enough to live on on its own. If that's all you've got coming in, you might claim pension credit on top or you might claim housing benefit for the rent and so on. So that's step two. Step three is extra money to do with disability, which is really important for the people we care for, and that will be the attendance allowance or the disability living allowance. There's just a few examples of them. Um, so Mr. Notwell, you can see what I've done there, Mr. Notwell. Um, he's on, his basic step one is contributory employment support allowance because for whatever reason he needs a bit of a top up, that will come from income related employment support allowance. Um, and then there's housing benefit, council tax benefit from step two. Then he gets his disability living allowance and the thing with the steps is when you get your disability living allowance you go back to step two because often getting an award of disability living allowance actually increases the amount of money you get and lots of people miss out on that. The Department for Work and Pensions are not very good at joining the dots. So what often happens is typically uh, say a pensioner is delighted to get their disability living allowance or their attendance allowance and they're, they're delighted to learn that it's not going to be taken away from their pension credit so it goes against the grain or you know it's counterintuitive to use the posh word to actually think that you might get more and a quick phone call a short form and suddenly you get another £59.50 on top on your pension credit so it's always worth checking that out and the pension credit have real problems with disabled carers. They can't understand how somebody with a disability can be a carer. You, if you can be both. You can have your own health problems. Caring can often bring its own health problems. So you, you can actually have extra amounts for being a carer and also claim your disability living allowance for your own health problems. So what's happening with welfare reform? Well, over pension age, um, it's not such a big deal. The, the changes aren't so scary or threatening. It's more for people coming up to pension age. We all have to going to be a little bit older before we can get our pensions. You know, the youthful faces in the room are going to have to wait quite a while. Uh, I'm going to have to wait till I'm 67. Just by a few months, my state pension isn't going to be paid till I'm 67. So that's, that's the downside of welfare reform for me. There's a big thing that your um, basic retirement pension is all protected, the triple lock guarantee, as they, politicians like to call it, which means you get the highest of either 2.5% um, increase, whatever earnings are doing, whatever prices are doing, you get the highest. So last year it was 2.5%, the basic retirement pension. So that's great. Unfortunately for people on the lower, the poorer pensioners who are on pension credit, they didn't get that protection. They just got the cash increase. So what they got overall was a 1.9% increase. And the official inflation figure was 2.2%. So actually, the poorest pensioners got a cut. Um, otherwise, there's a council tax. Hasn't, there hasn't been such a big change in, in Wales because uh, the Welsh Government have decided to have a sort of national scheme for this year. Over in England, council tax is a, is a right mess. <laughs> well, not mess, but there's 326 different schemes because every local authority is doing it its own way, desperately trying to balance the books. But even over, in, over the border, people over pension age are protected from all of that, so they don't have to worry too much about that. So, and things like bus passes and winter fuel payments, they're all being protected. The reason why older people on the whole are being protected is there's a lot of you, a lot of older people, which is great, you're very wise to be in a, in a good group, and you also go out and vote. So politicians are a bit scared of nicking your money. Um, what's happening for working age, I'm not going to go into detail, but there's huge changes in working age, and that's just summarising it. The top one is just fiddling around with the amounts of increases. 
inflation was running officially uh, at, um, well, the retail price index was 2.6%, but they decided to use a new index, which includes a wider range of goods. The consumer price index includes TVs and, and uh, projectors and all the wonderful Apple laptops and all the things that everybody on benefits regularly buys. Um, and so that's a lower figure because they, they often go down in price. Um, so that's a 2.2% um, figure, but they put this cap on 1% for, for most benefits, and that does affect carers under pension age. Um, so you, you get a large chunk of your money is at 1% uh, increase. They say they're protecting the money for carers, and they're protecting the money for disability and the money for children. They get the full 2.2%, um, but that's only the bit that you get paid as a carer, the basic amount. Uh, that you get as an individual person, which is the biggest chunk of your benefit, and I'll, I'll give you a quick example, that is frozen at the, at the 1%, so that's affected. So carers, um, a carer on income support on the, on the lowest income has actually last year had an increase of 1.4%. So they had a real cut in their benefit. It's all fiddling around, it's statistics, it's percentages, it's a, it's a pound here, it's 50p there. Over the time, it makes a huge difference, and the government have worked that out, and that's the biggest cut of all. Over the next few years, they're going to save about £9 billion by just taking a few pence off everybody. Then there are big cuts going on for lots of existing benefits. Housing benefit I've already mentioned, so basically there's lots of controls going on. The bedroom tax is one you may have heard about, um, as being particularly in the news these days. Um, then the tax credits, which is ironically is a benefit that's paid for people doing the right thing, moving into work. Those have been chopped in all sorts of different ways. I won't begin to go into the detail of that. Um, child benefit has been frozen, and then there's this affluence test where certain people are, are at the top end of the pay scale are losing their child benefit. Uh, and then they put this one-year time limit on contributory employment support allowance. That's the benefit, the old sickness benefit. You only get it for a year. You might still be sick, you pass all the medical tests, you score all the points, but you'll only get it for one year. There are things you can do about that, get advice if that applies to you. They're saying, well, it doesn't matter because if you're really poor, you can get the income-related means-tested version instead. Well, apart from why should you have to go to a means test, the other question is some people might be not quite that poor. Typically in this area, you might have one partner's working on low wages, one partner has got their £100 a week contributory ESA, and one partner's earning 200 quid. You take away £100, they won't get anything under the means test, they're not quite low enough to get that, but there's a third of their money has just disappeared up the Swanee, or down the Tawe. There's a general increase in, um, in stigma attached to being a benefit claimant. It's got a lot harder. Um, people are going through both the general mood music. Often, you know, when I last went to the cinema, there's one of those searchlights going, we know benefit fraud. I'm not condoning benefit fraud for a moment. You know, We know where you live, don't do it. Great, hit people with benefit fraud, but actually the problem is quite small. The public, when surveyed, think about 24% of the benefits money is gone in fraud. The official figure is 0.7%. So it's a big budget. It's, it's money that needs to be addressed. But doing this big scare tactic makes everybody who is a genuine claimant feel a bit shy about claiming. And it makes it harder. And on top of that, they're individually going to be sort of done over, um, <laughs> addressed and supervised and, uh, and managed uh, as part of, as welfare for reform progresses. Some of it is all positive to help people into work. A lot of it is just wagging a finger at you and telling you not to be naughty. This is what the system will look like once all the changes are through. So we're, it, we're in the next five years, we're going to have the old system running alongside the new system. So Mrs. Wise, um, he's wise enough to have been retired and passed most of this welfare reform. Her benefits change, uh, stay almost the same. They're not really affected. The only thing that changes is that instead of having any housing benefit for rent, that's going to be rolled into a pension credit. So not a lot of change there. Um, but Mr. Notwell, um, he's, gone through the, he's already gone through the change from incapacity benefit to um, in, in employment support allowance, or maybe just about to go through that change. He's got another change coming down the line because his disability living allowance is going to have to switch to personal independence payment, and then his means-tested benefits are going to turn into universal credit. So he's got quite a lot of changes coming his way. 
Ms. Caring, who's a carer, is similarly, she's a working age. Her carer's allowance, the basic carer's allowance, stays exactly the same, nothing, no effects there. Uh, but again, her means-tested money is going to be rolled into universal credit. If she's a disabled carer, she's going to find that universal credit is a lot meaner because under income support means-tested benefits, you can claim an amount for both your own disabilities, a disability premium, severe disability premium, and you can claim also an amount for being a carer. And the same, you can, same with pension credit. You can be a carer and disabled and get extras. They're getting rid of that for working age. Universal credit is going to be either or. You cannot both be a carer and disabled. You can still claim your disability living allowance, you can still claim your carer's allowance, but you won't get a means-tested top extra for both. It's one or the other. So carer's allowance carries on as before, um, but will the person being cared for, the worry for people getting carer's allowance is if you're looking after somebody who's under the age of 65, will they be able to transfer successfully from DLA to personal independence payment? Because if they don't, then you'll lose your carer's allowance. Um, there's the real cut in value of benefits that I mentioned before, and there's this switch to universal credit instead of income support and working tax credit, but that only affects people who are carers who are below pension age. Those above pension age are sort of escape from all of that, apart from those who've got, uh, who are above pension age but have a partner who's below pension age. At the moment you can count as pension age if the older partner makes a claim or you can choose to be working age if the younger partner does it. But under universal credit it will be the younger partner will have to make the claim so then you'll be dragged into the welfare reform mire if you're one of those mixed age couples. Carer's allowance, that's, you know, that's basically if you're looking after somebody who gets the right rates of DLA, attendance allowance, and in the future, personal independence payment. You're doing your age between 16 and 65. Uh, no, it's between 16 and any, any age. There's no t upper limit. Um, it's not worth a lot for considering the national minimum wage, and you have to work at least be 35 hours a week. 59.75 is no great reward. Uh, a carer is worth 430 pounds a week, I think. And the latest figure will be on the carers' rights websites. Um, and but the point of claiming well, it's worth something, it also triggers an extra amount. So it can be worth, even if you're receiving a retirement pension, you can fill in a form for carer's allowance, you'll get a letter back saying, sorry, we can't pay you because you're already getting retirement pension, but show this letter to pension credit because that will trigger an extra £33 on your pension credit. So it can be worth claiming carer's allowance, even though you might know that you're not actually going to be paid the carer's allowance itself. There is a danger if you do get paid the carer's allowance and get advice about this in your own individual circumstances that it sometimes, in some situations, it can affect the benefits of the person you're looking after. Not in every situation, so it's always a bit of a warning and look into it and have a word with people like Age Concern, Citizens Advice, or if, it, if you're a person affected by cancer, drop me a message on the online centre. Plug, plug. So this is Miss Caring on her income support. She gets her uh, 6.59.75, but that's all she's got to live on. So she can get income support to top it up. And her income support will be made up of an amount for her as an individual, which is 71.70, plus a £33.30 carer's uh, pr premium. And then they take away the carer's allowance from that. So what income support does, it doesn't give you the, the figure, it tops you up to that figure. So she's on 59.75, it tops her up to 105, it, so that she ends up with 105. So she's been hit by this, uh, her carer's bit, the carer's element, the £33.40 was, uh, was protected by, uh, with, a, with a full 2.2% increase. But the main chunk of her money, the 71.70, wasn't. That was 1% limit. So she's had a real cut. finish off with um, 
uh, I've, there, there are some copies of the slides which go into a lot more detail about what's happening to the benefits for the person you're looking after because obviously that's important to you as a carer you want your person you're looking after to do well and also their benefits directly affect you and the changes that they're going through at the moment is a big issue in Carmarthenshire because a lot of people have been long term on incapacity benefit it's that switch over to employment support allowance the Parliament was told that about 15%, 1-5% of people would fail the test because it is a tougher test. It's not a test that finds you fit for work, it's a test that moves the goalposts and is a harder test because the old test was already the hardest test in the uh, developed world. So the new test is even harder. So it's not that these 15%, or actually it's turned out to be 35% are fit for work, it's just that they are no longer deemed by the DWP to be ill enough to be excused from the rigours of signing on and being a job seeker. So that's what the DWP is saying. So there's a whole load of new, quite poorly, oops, sorry, quite poorly job seekers turning up at job centres, and the job centre staff are scratching their heads, going, "There's no way this person's ready to look for work." You know, we we try and work with them and encourage them, but they're so ill, and often they're sort of saying, "Don't tell anybody, but here's an appeal form. <laughs> Fill that in. Put in an appeal against your uh, employment support allowance." That process is supposed to finish by March of next year. It's run well behind um, employment support allowance the medicals are in a bit of a mess um, so um, they're uh, uh, it's not going to be we don't know when it's going to finish but it will carry on through to next year and at the moment it seems to be quite a lot of um, the people that are going through the system at the moment seem to be quite severe pe um, uh, dif uh, disabilities, including a lot of people that didn't have to go through the old tests because they rather sensibly in the old days saying, well, if you've already been assessed as having highest rate care, we're not going to bother to test you. No, uh, ESA is an individual test for everybody. So people with severe mental health problems, DLA higher care, they're all having to go through the tests and they're the ones that are, seem to be coming up for appeals at the moment. That one nearly went on to on there. So that's number one. That's already happening. You may be familiar with it. 35% um, are being found to not pass the test. Always appeal. Because if you get support, if somebody's with you, I've spoken to advice colleagues, and very few times have they ever lost an ESA appeal. The system is systemically failing. It is not up to the t job. The test is being reviewed at the moment, and Atos performance is being reviewed in implementing it. It is a failed test, but that won't stop certain newspapers saying, oh, these people have been work shy, lay about scroungers for years. Not true. Um, they're winning the appeals. Even overall, more than ha nearly half of appeals are winning, and that includes people that don't turn up on the day and just send in the papers, and the tribunal looks at it. But if somebody goes along, talks to the tribunal, has some support there, has an advisor with them, they're almost certainly going to win the case. And we've got so many examples of people getting naught points on the test and then being put by the tribunal into the support group, which is you know, the top level of the most poorly. So tribunals don't have much confidence in the test. So that's there. The migration to universal credit, well, at least that's, there's no, you don't have to do another medical assessment. That's just going to be a paper exercise. Um, overall, there aren't cuts, so everybody's going, oh, it won't be so bad. And the big joke at the moment is, when's it going to happen? And MPs like to warm their hands on the red faces of the Secretary of State for Depart Work and Pensions because you know, it's, it's not his fault, fair enough, it's embarrassing that it's delayed. Well, it may be his fault in one way, but the computer ain't working. The computer says no. And as soon as they get the coal on the fire to get the generators going or find the valves or whatever's wrong with the computer, then they are determined to go ahead. So it will be coming. There's an announcement apparently in two weeks' time of the fourth version of the timetable, but with real commitment. The um, uh, Secretary of State says it will all be done by October 2017. It will happen. It's an article of faith. The Prime Minister is saying, well, let's not be religious about timetable, but be religious about the principle. It is going to happen. It's the big flagship thing. Overall, it's not too bad. So people are taking their eyes off the ball. And to work out what's happening, you have to be a geek and do the sums. Having been a geek and having done the sums, I'm particularly worried about how it's going to affect people with disabilities because they've got rid of help uh, extra disability elements. There's no severe disability premium. There's no enhanced disability premium. Um, and they're cutting, they're saying they're protecting the most vulnerable. 
most people of all political persuasions would think that children with disabilities in lowest income households would be vulnerable. They're getting their extra for, bit of, for disability chopped in half. And then finally coming up uh, is the, uh, person, the other switch that people with health issues and long-term disabilities are worried about is a switch from DLA to PIP. Uh, personal independence payment. That isn't nothing instant's going to happen to them. For the people having renewals, or, you know, whose awards are coming up to the end, the key date in Wales is March the 17th. If your award is due to end before March 17th, you, you should be sent a, a disability living allowance claim pack. If it's due to end after March the 17th, it will, it's due to be um, a uh, personal independence payment. For everybody else, you sit tight if you've got a long-term award nothing's going to change unless you ask to change if you think oh well things have got worse for me I need to ask for a higher rate of DLA if you do that now it will be treated as a claim for the personal independence payment and you'll be reviewed under those rules um, and similarly um, uh, if you're uh, if your award runs out and, and things, or you can actually choose if you, if you don't just want to get it over with. Some people might do better out of personal independence payment. The DWP reckon around 30% will do, get more out of personal independence payment than DLA. Overall, though, it's about a 28% cut in support for disabilities. And you can't say where that cut's going to be. Very few people will stay the same. They've got rid of the lowest rate of care, but it doesn't mean that it's only going to affect those people. Because some of those people, actually looking at the scheme, we think we might be able to, with good support from an advisor, it might be easier to get an increase for under the new system than was un available under the old system. So don't give up if you're looking after somebody on the lowest care. Um, but if you're um, middle care, higher care, higher mobility, lower mobility, the rates look the same, but the benefits are very different. So lots of people are going to come down from higher mobility and lose their higher mobility. The go government reckon about 400,000 are going to do that. 200,000 are going to go up the other way from lower mobility to higher mobility. So there's movements all over the place. Only 16% are expected to stay the same. So it's a big change coming up, but it only really kicks in uh, unless there's a change of circumstances that forces you into the hands of the DWP to have your claim looked at. It won't be f until October 2015 that they will start looking at everybody who's on DLA. It won't affect people who are wise enough to be make sure they were born so that they were over 65 on April the 8th this year. If you were over 65 and you're on disability living allowance, you won't be affected by these changes. But if you weren't over 65 at that point, then at some point between October 2015 and October 2017, they will come, they will send you an invitation. And you might think, oh, that's very nice, but I'm washing my hair. Um, I'm rather busy. Um, I'm quite happy with my lifetime award for DLA. If you ignore that invitation, your DLA will just be stopped. So a lot of people who don't, are not very good with their post might fall foul and get their DLA stopped. They can get it restarted by applying for PIP, um, but they can, might have lost a lot of money in between. So it's one to watch out for. And there'll be lots of information around. Uh, I'm sure there'll be uh, on the uh, Advice and Support Command and Share website. Um, there's you know, Citizens Advice, Age Concern, Carers Groups. There's lots of bits around. You can get yourself a copy of the Big Book of Benefits. I have a, a demonstration copy here, but it's too heavy to lift behind John. Um, and uh, I say if you're affected by cancer, do drop in to, um, if you're in Singleton Way, drop in there or, or um, have a go if you like doing the internet because we're so techy here. Um, then, um, you know, give me a, a, a bell, or no, not a bell, a, uh, send me a message or whatever on the online centre. I'd be delighted to tip back. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Yeah.